Welcome everyone to our panel session today on OSPOs in academia or open source program offices in academia. And I am delighted to be joined here today with four great panelists who are all here to share their personal experiences, first-hand experiences of running OSPOs or OSPO-like institutions in various different academic institutions. Um, so before I go any further, I'd just like to introduce myself. My name is Claire Dillon and I am part-time executive director in Unisource Commons, but more importantly, I'm also the organizer for the OSPO plus plus network which is a community or network for those who are interested in creating open source program offices in academia or government and i'm here today with uh, saeed chowdhury from johns hopkins university please wave as i say your name so everyone knows who, who, who's who here so welcome saeed and um, i'm all, he's also joined by stephen jacobs from um, rochester institute of technology hi stephen uh, stephanie Ligi from the U university of santa cruz um, and john whelan from trinity college dublin Lovely to see you all here today. So first, we're actually going to go to each of our panelists and hear a little bit about their open source program office um, in their institution, how it, how it, where the origins came from and what it actually is responsible for. So Saeed, perhaps I'll start with you. Would you like to give us a, a lowdown of what's happening in Johns Hopkins University? I'd be happy to do that. Thanks, Claire. Uh, so I lead the open source programs office here at Johns Hopkins University. I am based in the libraries and the OSPO is therefore within the libraries as well and we made that decision for two reasons uh, one is we believe that one of the important functions of an OSPO is the curation uh, of open source software so that it aligns nicely with the mission of the library to curate digital content and the second is that the library is uh, one of the organizations that serves all of the academic divisions within the university so we wanted to make it clear that we weren't uh, favoring or, or maybe uh, you know, disempowering any of the particular divisions, uh, you'd be surprised who's producing open source software within a university. For example, uh, we have a music conservatory where there's a very thriving active open source uh, uh, effort and community uh, as well. Uh, not surprisingly, one of the fundamental assertions that we've made is that open source software is a primary research object. Uh, and therefore it needs to be treated the way we treat open access articles and open data. Uh, from a you know theoretical perspective, there are obviously some differences that, that span those three types of research objects. And that has the benefit of activating other parts of the university, uh, like the research administration office, the provost office, the technology transfer office, and so on. So when I say the OSPO is based within the libraries, it is working very closely with other units throughout the university that care about uh, research, research administration, uh, and the translation of that as well. So in addition to the types of things you might see in a corporate OSPO at the operational level, uh, providing tools, services, uh, community management, so on, to help raise the overall capacity of, of open source production within the university, we like to think that we're developing a center of competency and then perhaps eventually even a center of excellence. Uh, there is the important three elements of university research education and translation so we are also focusing on our open source efforts in those three areas so direct support for research not only as a research object but as an object that supports the research uh, in the educational sphere we have been working with Stephen Wally at Microsoft uh, on a course called semesters of code which is expanding into other places this fall including Ireland uh, and then we look at translation, which is how do you take the research and education and uh, translate it outside the walls of the university. So that is one of the places where we're connected to technology transfer. But I will say we've taken a much broader interpretation of a translation. And there's a very significant component of partnerships uh, and social impact in some of the work that we're doing as well. And maybe we can talk about that a little later in the panel. Thank you so much, Saeed, for that overview. So Stephen, we'll come to you now in Rochester Institute of Technology. Perhaps you can give us an overview of your experience with open source program offices. Sure, so um, RIT came to creating its, its open programs office, and we don't call it an open source programs office because we don't want to exclude the various other members of the campus, right? In fact, what we refer to is, is within academia and we're running a summit on open work in academia September 7th through 9th this year. Uh, you know, we have, as Saeed indicated, right? You know, we have people in music, people in art, people in all kinds of different um, 
practices that aren't generally considered necessarily software centers and aren't just open sourcing. You know, we cover help with CC licensing, with open data, with open science, with all the opens, right? Which is why we refer to it as open work so that we're inclusive across the campus. Um, we come to this with 14 years of experience in teaching undergraduate students uh, open source and engagement with the industry around open source. So we have um, individual courses, a three course uh, collection that in, in the broad sense, it's called an immersion. Each student on campus needs to take one immersion that involves general education courses so that they're working outside of their discipline. And we have a five course academic minor in open source. And most of that work is focused on uh, being a member of community, making contributions, so on and so forth, rather than code, right? It's, it's about how to become a contributor. Uh, in about two years ago, uh, well, really four years ago or so at this point, we heard about what Saeed was spinning up and we decided to do the same in terms of doing some kind of open programs office on campus. Mine lives organizationally under the VP of Research and works with all the entities on campus when we expect an open programs office to work with, you know, the ITS folks and, and the libraries, et cetera, et cetera. We also have a fellowship program where we're supporting roughly 25 faculty in building open community around their projects. Um, that is built on a model we've run for officially branded for about eight years, but really much longer called LibreCorps, which takes our cooperative education students, our full-time paid interns, and has them working on humanitarian uh, projects that are open source. Um, those efforts in the past did things like contract with UNICEF to support their venture teams, build um, essentially summer work programs and charter schools, teaching them to build uh, 3D hands with the um, Enable group, and that turned into a full-time program within the charter school we work with, so we do that kind of work. Um, and so it was taking that kind of structure of working with projects we built externally to RIT, and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation funded us to bring that kind of work internal to our own faculty, students, and staff. That's brilliant. And, and I'm hearing already that there's such a broad way in which you can actually interpret the responsibilities of an open source program office or an open program office in um, in academia. And what I'm loving hearing is as well this this idea of inclusivity and the diversity of the types of folks you have engaging with the program office as well. Um, so often people think about it just from a software developer perspective, but it's wonderful to see this actually branching out and reaching so many more disciplines and we need more cross disciplinary Innovation, so that's all brilliant. So Stephanie, I'm going to come to you now. So you see Santa Cruz, what's going on there? Well, I guess, hi, Stephanie Luigi. I am at the Assistant Director of the Center for Research in Open Source Software. And as, since January, also the Assistant Director at our OSPO here at UC Santa Cruz. And it's the first uh, OSPO in the UC system and one of the first at a public university. And it really started uh, because of our experiences with CROSS which in and of itself is a research center. Uh, and that's, it's housed in the Baskin Engineering, the Baskin School of Engineering at UC Santa Cruz. And we started, we're particularly my, uh, the director of CROSS and the director of the OSPO, Carlos Maltzan, started it in uh, 2015. And it was a way of bridging the, a gap, the gaps between student research and open source software. And it was really modeled, and, it, and this is kind of important for how we uh, kind of our history with CROSS is what led us to the OSPO that we have now. Um, and we modeled the CROSS after um, the activities and success of Sage Weil, who is, was a PhD student at UC Santa Cruz who created the open source storage system, Ceph, while he was doing his dissertation, as part of his dissertation. And once he uh, got, you know, graduated, had a startup around Ceph, and sold it to Red Hat, he came back to UCSC um, really wanting to set up a, uh, some sort of system, some sort of infrastructure to allow other students to replicate what he did. Um, and he was able to, to do a lot of his work because he had the resources to keep working on his project. And that was kind of what our focus with CROSS was. 
So he gifted uh, Carlos and UCSC uh, $2 million to get CROSS started. And we created it as a, an industry university collaboration research center, so IUCRC. Um, and it was really successful. We worked with a lot with industry members um, and um, we really saw that open source projects are really a powerful catalyst for industry engagement. And we also saw like leveraging open source communities significantly increase the, the impact of university research and a lot of what I think what um, Saeed and um, Stephen were already talking about with that. Um, but we also did start to realize that some um, difficulties of doing this as a, a research center, as opposed to a larger organization on campus. So um, we were really doing activities that just didn't make sense for a research center to do. And we were lucky to find the OSPO++ uh, uh, folks, you and all the rest, and really gave us a, an understanding of what we should be working towards, which was creating an OSPO. Um, and so in you know, working with OSPO++ folks, working with uh, um, all the universities, that already had OSPOs. And then um, thanks to the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, we were able to start the pilot project starting in um, this, last, this last January. Um, so at the moment, CROSS sits, just sorry, the OSPO sits it, still in the Baskin School of Engineering, um, just like CROSS. But we really do envision that it will be in the um, Office of Research ultimately. Uh, alongside research development and the tech transfer folks, the, those that are engaged with industry. And to say, we, uh, I want to point out that we've actually had a lot of success working with those folks in um, over the last five years, six years with CROSS, and definitely they've been very supportive of the OSPO process or creating the OSPO. Um, so that's been, I think that's been a, you know, something we can talk about a little bit too about having the champions that you find um, when you're creating your OSPO. Um, now, our chief role at the moment is to really facilitate avenues uh, to amplify research and research impact and leverage open source communities. But um, we also are really focusing on filling gaps that include like creating more uh, uh, opportunities for students to learn how to productively engage in open source. And we're doing that through um, coursework. We have fellowships for postdocs, and I will talk, I can talk about that more uh, during the panel discussions, but we have uh, postdoc fellowships that aim, aside from seeding communities um, uh, or open source communities around open source projects, also teaching students how to productively engage and, and interact with open source. Um, we also, you know, you know, based on our success with CROSS, we definitely uh, focus on the promotion of industry engagement with academic research and open source ecosystems, and also really just figuring out, and this is something I think that's, that's key to what we're working on in the next six months, is figuring out how to best assign value to open source in academia. Um, and I think that that's something that's been missing, like understanding how, how important open source is actually in a value, from, a, from a value perspective to, um, to university research. And yeah, and that's it. I'm happy to talk about all other specific programs in, in the rest of the panel. Brilliant. Thank you, Stephanie. So um, you mentioned there as well, uh, working with folks in the tech transfer office. So I'm going to come to John Whelan next, uh, who has lots of experience in that in that area. And uh, I know John's open source program office is, I think, one of the first that um, has been in, in academia in Europe. So John, do you want to give us a little overview of what's been happening with Trinity? Nice to meet you all, and thanks, Claire, for having me. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting where I'm, I'm lucky that everybody else has spoken earlier, so I understand where you're positioned. And, you know, Saeed spoke in particular about, you know, research, education, and translation. So, as Claire said, we our OSPO is definitely based within the translation side. We, I'm in the technology transfer office, or knowledge transfer as we uh, like to say rather not to exclude all the people in humanities uh, side of research and yeah we've been like I met Claire two or three years ago on this topic and I couldn't spell OSPO and then when she introduced me to Saeed and I understood well that's we've been kind of doing this for the last 10 years I mean I have I'm I always have to say this, by the way, I am a coder. 
So I think that gives me some validation when you come to open source for, I think it can be an important thing to understand the culture. I did use open source as a coder. I think I brought that into Trinity 12 years ago when I, when we, when I started working in technology transfer. But um, yeah, we have been doing a lot over the past, for example, we're very focused in our office in spinning out campus companies. The Irish focus in research and innovation is very much about creating economic impact through high tech, deep tech spin outs. So for example, 10 years ago, we spun out a company called Software Radio Systems, which I had to convince the powers to that be to allow open sourcing of a major body of software radio that had been developed. But my argument was that there was like a new software radio already out there. So we couldn't compete with this. So we had to join, join up. And that company has done very well. They've been around for 10 years. They're employing 30 people. Um, they're probably going to be acquired soon, I suspect. Um, but even other than that, there is a gauge with, with students, for example, we have a great uh, dropout students, which is always a good sign in our book <laughs> in innovation, but I know that can cause problems within universities, but in computer science, as you know, dropouts can be very frequent, but there are two Ukrainian, actually two Ukrainian brothers called the Zorin brothers, Z-O-R-I-N, four or five years ago, did a fork of Linux, um, which now is 18 million downloads it's called Zorin OS and they're doing very well so you know we've uh, you know we don't we talk to the library about what they're doing we we talk to computer science teaching what we're doing but at the moment we're driving it through our own actions and engaging industry a lot of the in industry engagement that we do a lot of the big multinationals now want the research to be open sourced and it gets around all the licensing problems. It gets all around all the confusion. And I know Claire, when she was in Microsoft, would have been familiar with that. But the big, the big, uh, the big, the top ten tech companies. That's that's the way they work. So that's been really fruitful for us um, to engage in that way. Brilliant. Thank you. So, so what I'm hearing is that again, a very broad set of responsibilities, often tied to either the the institution priorities or, in fact, where the idea comes from and the fact that that's where it perhaps instantiated. But, but, you know, I suppose it, to contrast the the work of an open source program office in academia, it seems to to maybe what's happening in the corporate world. It strikes me that not only are you all perhaps looking at you know what's happening within your university or academic institution, but but you're also looking at this educational aspect, perhaps with a, an additional emphasis because you're building the skills for the future there. Um, but this idea of tech translation or, or technology translation or um, is so such an important one and the industry engagement so what i'm going to ask for next is, is just to maybe have a think about you know trying to explain what's the kind of breakdown of the effort within your organization and what kind of skills are are needed within an ospo in an academic institution to do that work and um, because sometimes just to see whether there are similarities or differences or to give people an idea about what, what's required to, to, to actually make it work and um, so maybe we'll go in opposite direction this time john what do you think yeah, thanks thanks for that i think you know the whole thing about technology transfer knowledge transfer is it's all it's a people sport it's about engaging with people and i think open source has been a very good way for us to build trust with researchers because traditionally let's be honest technology transfer is quite a conservative business and they would have had a quite a negative view about open source 10 years ago or maybe even still now let's be honest um you know, a lot of them come from life sciences. They're not familiar with software in itself. And so they just say, why are you giving it away from f for free? So I found if we convince researchers and teachers that we're actually, we understand it, we see the business models behind it. We see the community models behind it. We see the societal impact of good open source software. COVID has, has shown that with you know, a lot of the apps, the main COVID app developed in Ireland was all open source. So it was transparent, privacy issues are dealt with. So huge advantages. 
I can give one example of one researcher that I've only, I've been here 13 years. This researcher I know was really anti-technology transfer. You know, he liked to open source, but he came to me eventually to ask a question about open source because he saw we had an OSPO and he was doing a real cool thing. He was doing a Python uh, version, a scratch type version of Python actually, which was really cool. But when he saw that I was actually open and supportive and that our office was saying, yeah, that's great. You, you, uh, we support you. We provide you with the tools and agreements that can work um, to engage with industry or to engage with society. So, you know, but it's a time thing and it's a people thing. And, and so what I'm hearing is that that kind of background knowledge of the, um, of the I, I suppose, subject matter, so like understanding open source from a technical perspective, being able to work with folks who may be coming from a technical background, but adding in the knowledge about both the industry, how it works, and the legals of how um, open source works are kind of key critical skills to, to make in that work. Um, yeah, so, so brilliant. So Stephanie, what, what would you like to add into that or, or to comment on in terms of the skills that might be um, part of your group there in Cross? Right, for our experience and what is, I think, really interesting from how Cross came about, Cross was built and how the OSPO has now come about, is that we really have a total, a real mix of skills that have come into play. Um, I, you know, uh, Carlos, who's the director of Cross and, you know, was co one of the co-founders uh, of Seth, um, you know, had a very strong, obviously a very strong computer science technical background. I mean, he's a, you know, a professor here at UCSC, um, you know, very much on the technical side. A lot of our, our fellows who are the ones that are the incubator fellows, the postdocs, all computer science or um, in some part, part of, uh, you know, the engineering school. And then you have me come in and I'm like a social scientist who, you know, doesn't know Python from whatever, you know, I don't have a technical background. I'm, I learned a lot over the last six years, but I came in with more of a uh, community management, a community, um, uh, you know, like a, com a community building skills and, um, and those type of activities that I had from my previous work in a completely different field. But it really helped that I understood, one, how academia works, because <laughs> I've always worked in academics. Uh, in an academic setting. Um, I know how, knew how researchers need to function and, um, and then also how communities get built around research. And I think that that was, um, those are, I think that the, both of those are, are important. Having the technical skills to understand um, kind of the coding and, and the individuals working on, the developers that you're working with, but also having um, the ability to create and sustain and maintain um, communities. And knowing when you don't, knowing who to look for when you need help on those is also really helpful. Because I didn't come in with an understanding specifically of open source communities, but that's something that I've gained in working with folks um, through OSPO++ through a lot of different groups. Um, when it comes to the licensing and a lot of the other te legal issues, we work with a great advisory board. And that is, I find really critical having a good advisory board um, and a good set of folks in open, uh, the Office of Research. Um, our advisory board is, bit, are, is made up of um, key people, but like experts in open source, um, experts on both open source projects, but also uh, the legal aspects um, and entrepreneurship as well. And but then our, you know, I don't feel like the, our, from our perspective, the OSPO has to have all of the legal understanding in, in house, specifically in the OSPO. As long as you know you have your kind of champions in your office of research or you have a really good set of advisors, that, that um, I think was, we, what I've figured has been a really useful thing to have for our OSPO. It's not that you actually have to have, like the director, assistant director has to have, be that legal voice or knowledge. Having some understanding of it is of course important, but always knowing that you have someone like in the office of research or, or on your advisory board that you can talk to and under, to, to get a, a good, a, a really good expert understanding is I think really critical. I, I mean, that's such an important point. I mean, like thinking about one of the principles of open source being collaboration, it just goes to show that you're actually making that work in action because, you know, <laughs> because you're focusing on the skills of collaboration and community building, you're able to pull on those resources and contributions from all over the organization, which is uh, which is fantastic to hear. And, and also, I suppose, promising for people getting started that they don't have to actually have baselines in all of these things because there's often people to help, right? So, right. Um, so thank you. Thanks you for don't have to be. You don't have to be everything all the time. Yeah.
Exactly. Yeah. That'd be hard. <laughs> and we know there's few enough people who are who are good enough at even at even the, the collaboration skills. So uh, so thanks for that, Stephanie. Stephen, what about you? Who 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 are you working with? Who's part of the organization? What kind of skills do they have? So I, I have a solid advisory board. You know, as, as Stephanie says, the, the person who runs your OSPO in academia needs to be the kind of jack of all trades that Stephanie kind of laid out, right? The, and it's especially key now, you, you know, not, not only in software, for, for a long time, the open source community has understood, they may not have done a good job of it, but they've understood how important community development, outreach, all those soft skills, all the organizational skills, all the communication skills. Um, and, and there seems to be a much larger shortfall there in open science that there's this, you know, neither an open source nor an open science, open scholarship, open academia, whatever open you want to call it. Um, sticking a license in a folder and putting your stuff on it and having it out on a website somewhere does not improve your impact or your translation. You need this person who understands where all the parts fit in and has the Rolodex to call if they need to. Um, like, uh, I have written code, I know how to write code, but I'm a filmmaker and a media critic by training and Every, all the other work that I've done has always been collaborative. Scientists and programmers are often not by training collaborative. And so being able to teach them how to pull all the parts together and how to do the outreach, how to set up the infrastructure to support that outreach um, is really what we've been doing with our, our fellows for the past two years and, and our fellows projects run the gamut of computational astrophysics to sign language early child education for deaf children around the world to a database of victorian autobiography called the victorian autobiography information network or vein which is my favorite project with my favorite acronym right so it, it spreads it, it spreads across the gamut if you're in an organization that works within academia. And not only there, but in terms of understanding your licensing and who you're working with, right? At, we really have this kind of spectrum of people we work with, right? You know, if you're at Google, right? Everybody is an employee. And in theory, everybody follows the policy, right? Boom. And at university, staff, same thing. But you have these other two use cases, right? You have faculty, which kind of are, but kind of aren't employees in the same way that staff are. They are mandated to distribute their stuff in some ways, but the university and often they would like the entrepreneurial opportunity as well. So there's that kind of gray area you have to work with them on. And then at our university, um, unless the work that students are working on is paid for by a grant or by the university, they own it. So they're an entirely different licensing use case. My, my students can roll in and I, I come out of the game program within our college computing. They can roll into a lab, use all of our hardware, all of our software, all of our networks, all of our software, software licenses, build their games. And then as long as when they incorporate, they pay for a corporate license for the stuff they've already built all they owe us is a thank you note, right? And so they're beholden to licenses in a different way. So that varies a little bit, but you have this spectrum of people where you can't just write one policy for all. You have to tell people about what would be the best practices for X, Y, and Z. Okay, so for software, you wanna use these licenses and you wanna release things this way. And if you want it to be permissive, you look to this stuff, right? What about your data? What about your hardware? Open hardware, open data. If you're CC licensing your artwork or your humanities work, right? What are the licenses you want to use there and why? So it's, it's in many ways, by its very nature, is much more spread out. And as John indicated, and as I'm sure Stephanie and Saeed can assert, you know, there are a lot of people reluctant to do things this way at this point in time. Um, but nobody no longer really has a choice, right? unless you are self-funding your own research out of your grandfather's inheritance, whether it's a science foundation or somebody else, 
your stuff needs to be open. And as we see from recent in the US, we see from recent solicitations from uh, the NSF and from guidelines from the NIH and those places, they also acknowledge at this point sticking in a folder somewhere. You've got to have data plans, you've got to have you know, the sustainability written out as an open thing. So it's, it's becoming more and more important. It also is more and more important to refactor your tenure and your promotion policies around this stuff, right? It's most of the work that needs to be done in an open project doesn't end up as a peer reviewed journal article in nature, right? It doesn't. So how do we recompense, support, promote, and grow the careers of people who don't follow those traditional policies? How do we adjust our policies to support it? So I'm beginning at this point, I'm beginning to like really begin to think that you all are doing amazing jobs because the, the, again, the scope is so much broader than some folks um, that might be working in a, in a more boxed corporate environment. Um, but the but the breadth of the types of scenarios you deal with, of course, is so broad compared to, again, a corporate environment where it's kind of like, well, we build this. So likely speaking, most people are doing these kinds of, of engagements. Therefore, we can narrow our focus in that respect. Um, and and of course, to your point, in many respects, you, you don't have the way to either dictate or put governance policies in quite the same way as an organization might. So the challenge is even greater for all of you. Um, uh, so hats off to, 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 the, to, to, to actually succeeding in that kind of environment. Saeed, how, how do you handle that, that broad and breadth of, of everything we've talked about so far in terms of what you try to achieve? I try to get lots of sleep. <laughs> um, so, um, I'll, I'll build on everything you've heard so far and try to do that university and, and industry comparison throughout. So th there, I, I will make the case for having some core technical skills in your OSPO, right? So we do some of the things you would imagine in any kind of corporate setting. We have DevOps people and software engineers and so on, supporting the software engineering practices and trying to raise the collective capacity and understanding around that. We, we support the university's GitHub account. We're about to sign the agreement for GitLab. We run the Baturgen analytics and so on. So tools that people need. And sometimes it's as simple as you don't have to pay for your GitHub account. We can, we can cover it through the OSPOs all the way to, are you aware of what you're doing with your software? Who's using it? Who's committing? How long it takes to do certain things? So those are very similar, I think, across any kind of en entity that's thinking about open software, whether it's university, government, or, or industry. But you know, I've mentioned this before, universities and companies have CIOs, right? And again, they're probably thinking about a lot of the same issues. I'm not aware of any company that's running a hospital, like Johns Hopkins. I'm not aware of any company that has students, that you have to protect their student records, right? So CIOs in universities have common things with corporate CIOs, but they have very unique aspects, just given the mission, the players, the actors in a university setting. Um, so you know, we heard about this, the level of autonomy <laughs> um, is quite impressive within the university, particularly for tenured faculty members. So when we first started the OSPO here, uh, I met with a faculty member who was the chair of a committee looking at, at basically tech transfer issues. And he said, nobody tells me how to manage and publish my articles. Nobody tells me how to manage and publish my data. What makes the university administration think they can tell me how to manage and publish my software? And it's a perfectly good question in a university setting that I don't think is true in a corporate setting. <laughs> you, you can tell your employees, this is what you will do. If I tell a faculty member what to do with their software, it'll be a very brief, unpleasant experience for me. Uh, and depending on the nature of the faculty member, maybe for them or maybe not, maybe they might enjoy it. So th there, there just simply needs to be an acknowledgement that the culture, the mission, the, the, the level of autonomy, the types of players in the university setting is fundamentally different. The, the power of persuasion is essential uh, in a university setting. You, you cannot show and say this is the way it's going to be. And Stephen's correct, the federal funders and even some of the private funders are moving in the direction of requiring more public access, they call it, typically not necessarily open. But even those policies leave a lot of room for interpretation and, 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 and universities to come up with ways about how they're going to adhere to these things. And in, in reality, most funders work with the university community to develop those policies. They don't make them on their own and suddenly announce them. I've heard from many program officers that we don't want unintended consequences. We know there will be some, 
But to the extent we can work with the universities to figure those things out, uh, the, the better off we will all be. So I, I do believe the gospel has some common foundations, primarily at the technical, the software engineering type level. But as you move further and further up towards research, education, translation, community building, it's very different in a university setting, and I'm sure it's very different in a government setting. And the reason I was drawn to OSPO++, quite frankly, is people with those backgrounds, <laughs> people with the, the scars that you get in trying to, quite frankly, you know, nudge the culture in an organization are the ones coming to the, these events, sharing the stories and so on. Uh, I, I wouldn't presume to tell someone in corporate America how to do things because I've never worked in corporate America. Um, so it, it, if you want to get things done in the university, it, it, it requires a very specific kind of understanding of the culture and the context. Yeah, just to, to say to a little, right. Well, I said policies have to be changed. In academia, that's three to five years if you're lucky, right? So mm -hmm. at the moment, at OpenRIT, you'll find suggested best practices listed on our website that when people come to us we steer them to here's what we suggest you use as a license that how you structure your repos how you engage with people outside the university but we cannot say that that's policy now and it may never be policy it depends on the university we don't get to make that choice right so, so if, if i can also just jump in there uh, yes. steven's correct that's typically the the pace at which things move in the university. But there are external uh, drivers or shocks to the system. Uh, the NIH has announced a data sharing policy effective January 2024. And I've been involved in a lot of conversations with a lot of people about updating Hopkins data retention and, and sharing policy, which we're doing in roughly a year and a half, a year, depending on how you, when you think we started. Federal agencies are going to start thinking more intentionally about open source software policy. So we, we have an opportunity to interact with them and influence that process and accelerate it. But once the uh, federal funding agency makes that kind of announcement, universities will have to respond and we do move faster than we typically do. So th there's opportunities there uh, around open source software policy development. So thanks. Thanks everyone for that. If, if, if I can just like kind of summarize then where we're at, because, you know, what I'm hearing is that the, the requirements for uh, folks in open source program offices in academia um, has the base basics that oftentimes is there in the corporate world, but actually some additional um, uh, kind of context that needs to have, that folks need to have an understanding of in order to be effective there. Um, I think I think we're all lucky though that the, the corporate world has done so much background in terms of the actual like resources that are available uh, for folks that, you know, coming from groups like the To-Do organization who, where they're actually building an awful lot of resources that can then be leveraged in the context of universities. Um, but it sounds like there's a lot additional stuff that can be layered on top of that for the specific context of academia um, to, to be able to, to help your own journeys. Um, congratulations to you all on and the work you've done so far to help all those areas. And, and thank you so much for sharing your stories with us here today. Fortunately, we've come to the end of our time um, but I want to thank again Stephen and Stephanie, Saeed and John for joining us here today and, uh, and I hope that everyone in Austin is having a great event and we look forward to hopefully catching you up in person next time. So thanks everyone and goodbye for now. Bye bye now. Thanks Claire. Bye bye. Bye thanks. in on your own or I'll type them for you. I, I have a hand. Sir. Uh, do we have a microphone or just just shout. I can hear you. All right, so what is that question? Or, or... Right, so I'm requesting two points, uh, one of opportunity and one of apprehension around the differences in ecosystem role 
of academic OSPOs and academic open access community organizations, such as com like student organizations, et cetera. Okay. Do you have more or you want us to talk about those or what? Um, I would love to hear your thoughts and um, you, the very like educated perspectives that you have in the states of maturity in your organizations. So what are the states of maturity of, of student engagement and what else? The difference between an OSPO and an academic student organization and kind of what that difference in the ecosystem looks like, what opportunities an OSPO affords that a student organization does not, um, and vice versa. Okay, I have typed it in kind of sort of mostly. Let's see what they say. Thank you. Um, for me, we engage with students as part of the OSPO. Again, because of that situation that we have where students own their own IP, right? I don't have policy written yet because policy only comes from a very long academic process. We have our best practices that are, you can see on our website. And we point students specifically to this, the IP policy that says, you know, you guys own your stuff unless we're paying you or a funder's paying you. That said, these kinds of things about licensing, so on and so forth, we recommend that you follow them for, you know, your own good health in your project, right? It's, it's, you know, we often advise student production teams to incorporate you know, and within RIT, we have the Magic Center, which is where a lot of the student productions come out of. And if they want to publish, we're a studio, and they publish through us. They only you know, take like 3% if they make money eventually. But then they don't have to get incorporation pro you know, processes and get lawyers and all that stuff to have to pay fees. They're umbrellaed, so they're protected from being sued personally if there's an issue with the game or whatever. So similarly, the OSPO says, look, you can do what you want if it's a, a non-university funded thing, but you really ought to think about using these licenses and having these readmes in your projects and so on and so forth. It's, it's insurance for you, right? Um, so I hope that answers the question there. In chat, what I see Saeed saying is one of the interesting challenges in the university setting is balancing the creativity of student groups and the operationalization of software engineering practices. The Hopkins OSPO has engaged student groups offering support for their work without constraining or dictating what they do. Uh, having said that, it's important to note that an institutional policy or funder policy needs to be considered for even student work. So Saeed and I said the same thing in different ways. And I see there is a one minute sign. So one quick question, yes. So this might be a, a no-op question, but are there differences that you see in, in the role of OSPOs in, in academic settings between public and private institutions? Um, if Stephanie were here, she would be able to answer that better probably because Stephanie's the one at public university. Um, Said and I are both in private ones, so let's see if Stephanie is still here. I have, I have tried to ping her directly. We'll see if she pops up. Um, I will say, while well, we're waiting to hear back from Stephanie, if this is a discussion that interests you, um, RIT is doing a summit around those issues September 7th through 9th. I've got handouts in my bag. Happy to pass one on to you so you can see what we're doing. Claire says, I would note that there are major differences between all of the OSPOs we work with. And, and I'm going to ask her, 
Are you saying that as Irish Claire or as international Claire? <laughs> Said says public universities typically need to account for state guidelines or policies more than private institutions. Um, Tony Wasserman, who's in the virtual space, says there are differences, different meanings. Said says, but even public universities have to respond to federal private funder policies and guidelines. Um, Claire says she was speaking as international Claire, not just as Irish Claire. All right, and I think we're booted. Um, I'm happy to continue conversations in the hallway. Um, Thanks all. Um, also, if this is of interest, this stuff is of interest to you, I've got a session tomorrow about the fellowship program we run out of our OSPO and happy to talk about that.